Hey art nerds, happy holidays. So I know this one's a little bit belated for some of you guys, but I'm trying to wrap up some of the holiday art that I created in December that I didn't have a chance to release before December 25th. For some of us, Christmas is still going on until January 6th, so I think I've got plenty of time. Today, I'm gonna show you guys how to draw ink and watercolor a festive poinsettia wreath using a round watercolor block. I'm using the Dora Art watercolor block. This is an inexpensive cellulose-based watercolor block purchased from AliExpress in a round format, but there are plenty of round watercolor papers on the market. You can cut your own, you can trace um, a circular container lid or some other large circular thing to get your circular shape. Or you could use like Shizen's pre-torn circular watercolor pages. How many times am I gonna say circular? It's starting to sound really weird to me. Or there are some cotton rag circular or round, let's say round, watercolor blocks on the market. I'll list a few down in the description below if you guys wanna use the round format. I really like the Dora Art watercolor pad. It's not the best watercolor paper I've ever used, not by far. It's a standard cellulose watercolor paper. It's a bit thin, but it gets the job done. But what I really like is I really like how inspiring this format has been for me and how much I enjoy working in the round. You guys have probably seen a few other tutorials here on the channel where I demonstrate alcohol markers or watercolors in this block. I'll link a few down in the description below for you guys. So we're going to start by sketching our wreath. Now I have some reference up on my computer. I found a poinsettia wreath on Wayfair. So I'm going to be referencing that as I'm drawing. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to start with the poinsettias because they're some of the largest objects on this wreath. And I'm starting by sketching in their basic placement and I'm using just circles of varying sizes to represent varying sizes of poinsettias to help me place the poinsettias in this wreath. So here we have our poinsettias placed. Next, I'm gonna use smaller circles to help me figure out the center of the poinsettia. So we've talked about this in my how to draw poinsettias tutorial from a while back, but the red part of a poinsettia, those are leaves. The flowers or the florets are actually in the very center. It's those little yellow buds. So I'm drawing a circle to kind of help me place that and figure it out. Next, I'm gonna draw some oval shapes. This is to help me place the pine cones. I'm also sketching in some rounded leaf shapes. This wreath has magnolia leaves included with the fur greenery. So I'm drawing the magnolia leaves first and when I paint those, I'm gonna paint them a darker blue green so they stand out a bit more. Finally, I'm gonna start, or not even finally, I'm gonna start next by breaking down the individual poinsettias. So we're starting by drawing kind of teardrop shaped leaves radiating from the center of the poinsettia. And if you guys need a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to draw an individual poinsettia plant, I'll link that down in the description below. Hopefully you guys will check it out. I also did a live stream where I showed you guys how to use watercolor markers to color your own beautiful and vibrant poinsettia illustrations. So I'll link that as well. So I'm just kind of taking my time. I'm starting with the smaller leaves towards the center of our poinsettia and I'm gradually working my way around in kind of a loose spiral and my leaves are gradually getting larger as we're progressing towards the outside of the poinsettia. And I'm going to do this for all of the other poinsettias in this wreath.
Time lapse is kind of magic, isn't it? So speaking of, I've time lapsed various segments of this video at various speeds to still demonstrate what I'm talking about, but so it doesn't take forever to draw. I promise this wreath takes about 30 minutes to draw. It's really not that time consuming, but I know y'all don't want to just watch me sketch poinsettia leaves over and over and over again for 30 minutes. So now I'm going to start adding some details to the pine cones. And what I want to do is I'm drawing these sort of like crescent shapes. And thanks to the magic of editing, I've enhanced so you guys can see what I'm doing a little bit better. So these are kind of like rounded crescent or jelly bean shapes curving up so that the main, let's see, gosh, is that concave with convex being going in the other direction I guess they're concave but you guys can see what I'm doing basically you just want to keep those going in the same direction they're kind of like I think actually pine cones are like the flowers of the female pine trees I am sure someone will correct me down in the comments below if I'm wrong but you can think of them kind of like petals and that oh, I know it's the fruit and I know it drops the seeds but it came from a flower at some point anyway um they they kind of petal outward and with that like one really woody nodule being like the stamen so anyway if you don't know what I'm talking about google a pine cone and just look at that reference is your friend Next up, I'm just going to kind of refine some of the leaves, add in a few more, make some of them larger. I mean, they were basically pretty good the way they were sketched in before, so there's not really a whole lot to fuss about with them. And I'm going to save doing the actual fir branches, the pine needles, for when we're inking. So this is yet another tutorial where I use the Tombow Furinosuke brush pins. I love these things for inking, y'all. They are not just for brush calligraphers. They're for everyone. Uh, I'm going to use these to do colored line art. One of the reasons, there's a lot of reasons why I like these, but the top three reasons why I like the Tombow Furinosuke brush pins are they are waterproof and alcohol marker proof. They come in a bunch of different colors, which makes them great for colored line art. And the brushes are pretty dang fun to use. They're stiffer than your average brush pin, so if you're heavy-handed, these could be a good one for you. But once you kind of break them in, they've got a lot of flexibility, and they're fun to use. They're little speedy speed boys for inking. So basically, when you're doing colored line art, you can do whatever your heart desires don't let me stop you you do you boo but generally i try to think about what the local color of the object is and then i use a couple of colors to ink that maybe up to three so for these poinsettias i'm using red as the main local color with a little bit of purple to kind of add some shadow so the areas where the poinsettias would be in shadow i'm going to use purple for that Often what I'll do is I'll ink the whole thing in the local color and then go back in and ink the shadow color after just to add in some extra contrast. You don't have to do all this. I just like doing it and it works well for both my watercolor pieces and my alcohol marker pieces. I try to be kind of flexible in my approach to art. There's definitely a good order of operations to get what you want, but you can kind of play around with the order of operations to get the best end result. So for the centers of the poinsettias, the actual flower part, I'm using yellow as our local color, the main body of it, then orange to start adding in some shadow. And then if you look really closely at a poinsettia, I don't want to call it a poinsettia flower, a poinsettia plant, um, you'll notice that the little green stamens are sometimes visible. So I'm using a little bit of green just to ink that as well. And I'm just going to work my way around the round, inking the poinsettias. Here we go, the poinsettia wreath, the monkey chased the weasel.
Here's a great thing about using watercolor pads in the round format. You just twist it as you go. It's a circle. You just work your way around. Ooh, I hope I didn't make you guys too dizzy. So next I'm going to start inking the large magnolia leaves. I'm starting with green as our local color. And then I'm going to go back in with blue to start adding in some more shadow and definition. And for the pine cones, I'm using brown. And to add in some shadow, I'm using a Sakura Pigma FB in black. You can definitely use a black Tombow Furunosuke, but I've got like a million black brush pins around my studio. So I don't actually own the black Tombow Furunosuke because why? I own other black brush pins. But the Sakura Pigma FB has some of the same properties of the Tombow Furunosuke. The brush is a little bit softer than the Furunosuke, but it's still alcohol and water safe. So now I want to start adding in some of the fur needles. So I have enhanced so you guys can see what I'm doing. And I'm really doing <laughs> very basic sketching. It's really just to create placement so I don't overwork this piece too much. I'm going to do most of the work in the inking. So for the fur needles, I'm inking most of the individual leaves, the individual needles, using a blue Tombow Furunosuke. I'm going to ink the ones kind of at the crown or at the tip with the green, since it's such a light green. And then I drew a little brown nodule that's like the branch kind of peeking out. Now, you don't want to render this too much if you're going to paint it, because, I mean, then what's the point of painting it? You could totally leave this as is, as just like an an inked illustration. You might want to add in more detail if you're going to do it that way. Um, I try to straddle a line. I call this like my open line art because there's some detail, but there's not too much detail and it leaves a lot of room for me to add and adjust things in the watercolor. I don't feel like I have to do everything the inks say.
So this illustration is going to be allowed to dry for 24 hours so the inks can cure onto the paper that's going to make them less prone to ghosting, uh, lifting, or smearing. And then I'm going to erase my graphite using just a white vinyl eraser. I think I'm using the Pentel High Polymer for that. You can get those down at Walmart. Uh, mono, Tombow Monos are great too. Uh, sometimes art supply stores have them, sometimes not. So if you can't find them, the Pentel High Polymer is a pretty good close second. So for this illustration, since I'm painting on kind of a cheap cellulose paper that can really take a whole lot of work you just want to be mindful of like the needs of your paper just like you want to be mindful of the needs of yourself as an artist so we don't want to overwork this too much because this paper cannot take all that and paint will start to slough off if you try to do too much with it it's got its limits so I am starting with a mix of yellow with a little bit of phthalo blue and I am using the Da Vinci Mixing Palette. I really like this palette. I talked about it a while back. It's a good all-rounder palette. It really lends itself well to painting more natural things or more botanical things. So you guys have seen me use the Core Mini Palette a lot, like a lot if you watched my videos in December. And that's a great palette. But that one is a really good high chroma palette. So it can be good for painting people and good for painting clothing or good for painting like high color saturation botanicals, but the Da Vinci Mixing Palette is just good in general. You, you get a lot of paint for your money. Uh, these are large half pans, plenty of room to roll that brush around and pick up all that goodness. And you can refill it just using the Da Vinci tubes if that's what you've got handy. I ordered mine from Jerry's Artorama and I've been really happy with it since. So while that color is Still a little wet, but mostly dry. I'm going in with a thicker mix. So there's more phthalo mixed in with that yellow. And I'm just kind of letting it diffuse into it. I'm not trying to control it too much. So one of the plus sides of cellulose paper is it tends to dry faster, can dry faster than cotton rag paper. There's a lot of downsides to cellulose paper. I love both, but I'm aware of the flaws of both. That's important. You got to understand your paper. And um, it, it does not like wet into wet all that much. It just doesn't handle wet into wet as beautifully as a cotton rag paper would. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to make it like wet into wet. I'm applying a halo of clean water around our yellow center. And then I'm applying some yellow and allowing it to kind of diffuse out. It didn't diffuse out as much as I wanted, but it still worked out in the end. I'm still pretty happy with it. So next, I mix some sap green with some phthalo blue, not salo blue, some phthalo blue in order to get kind of a, a dark blue green. <laughs> like that's such a complicated concept. I like how I said, I, I paused to think about it, a dark blue green like i'm gonna like reveal some real wisdom to y'all come up with like a whole new color name that no one's ever heard of charmeleon no nah, that's a pokemon but y'all know what i mean like oh wow so wise anyway this is going to be the base color on our magnolia leaves so it's going to be our highlight color pretty much and while that's still wet, I'm dabbing in a little bit of the phthalo blue, basically straight from the source. So what you guys can't see is I am using a round daisy palette for this. It's just a cheap plastic palette. They're not the best. They've got their flaws, but 
I use them all the time anyway. I mean, it's like my relationship with cellulose paper. It's like, yeah, it's got some downsides, but I love it anyway. Maybe that's how y'all feel about me. And I allow the phthalo blue to kind of diffuse into the green. It took a little bit of time to dry because I really saturated it, but now I'm going over it with a thicker mix, a more saturated mix of our sap green and our phthalo blue, just to kind of blend the colors a little bit. I'm not trying to like actually mix it. I'm just trying to do a little bit of opti optical, not optimal uh, color blending. So for the pine cones, I really want to capture the light brown highlights. And the only way we can do that is with a little bit of underpainting. So I've mixed some yellow ochre with some of the burnt sienna in this set. And that gives us this like kind of amberish color. While that's drying, I went in and added a little bit more yellow and maybe a little bit of orangey yellow even to the centers of our poinsettia flowers. Poinsettia plants, Becca. And then while that's drying, I'm going in with just some straight up burnt sienna into our pine cones. And I'm trying to leave those little crescents that we drew earlier, the original color. So I'm trying to leave some highlights here. So the Da Vinci palette's kind of interesting in that it has basically three reds. You get like Da Vinci red, and then you get Alizarin crimson, and then you get Quinn magenta. So for the base color for our poinsettias, we're starting with a little bit of the, well, more so of the Da Vinci red with a little bit of the Alizarin crimson. And I'm just kind of painting a base color here. You can leave some white if you want to. You can leave some white behind. But if you don't white and if you can't white, then there's gouache you might find. Wow, that, <laughs> I lost the in there.
So I gave everything kind of a chance to dry. And now I'm going to start adding in some darker shadows to our poinsettias. So we're using a stronger mix of the Da Vinci red with some alizarin crimson. And we've also started adding in a little bit of the Quinn magenta to start getting some cooler shadows. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically apply a base color and I'm leaving lots of that original color still visible as our highlight. And I'm going to use a clean wet brush with just clean water. And I'm going to blend some areas out a little bit so the lines aren't quite so harsh and we get kind of a smoother movement of color. So next I'm going to use some dark or burnt umber with a little bit of the burnt sienna to start painting in more shadows on the pine cones. So here is my watercolor trick and it doesn't always work out well. It's really a your mileage me vary sort of situation, but it's something I learned while painting watercolor comics, which speaking of, if you haven't yet, I'd love it if you checked out my watercolor comics, 7 Inch Kara. You guys can read it for freezies at 7inchkara.com. So what I do is I basically wait until the most of it is dry 
or there's like a halo around it that's dry and most of the wet's in the center. And then I paint the adjacent things. So like in this instance, right, we have all these poinsettias and there's a lot of still wet paint on the poinsettias. But I've gone ahead and I've started painting the pine cones because as long as none of the wet areas are next to the pine cones or touching the pine cones, then it's not gonna bleed out. And sometimes you want it to bleed out because it adds some beautiful chaos and it kind of loosens things up a bit. So it's definitely a your mileage may vary situation. So to get some darker shadows on these points out is we don't have like a purple in this set. There's no dioxine purple in here. So we're gonna use some ultramarine and some Quin magenta and we're just gonna mix up a good old red violet. And we're gonna apply that to the shadows, mainly kind of towards the center. That's gonna make the yellow pop a little bit and also on some of the leaves in the background. And it's gonna dry lighter than it goes down. Don't worry, paint always, almost always dries lighter than it goes down. So the reason I said that tip is a your mileage may vary sort of thing is if you're like me, you're gonna find you're hovering your wrist over your painting to paint over wet areas, like you're hovering over wet areas so you can reach the unpainted areas. And it allows me to paint faster because I'm not constantly waiting for paint to dry. And I know someone out there is like, I don't have to use a hair dryer. I've talked about that. So I'm not going to talk about it today. Um, you can use a calligrapher's bridge for that. And it's basically something for you to risk wrist your rest on rest your wrist on the reason i don't is y'all would not be able to see half the illustration if i was utilizing my calligrapher's bridge i have a beautiful wooden calligrapher's bridge and it's fantastic it's different from an artist bridge in that it's not quite as tall it's closer to the paper so you got to be careful when you're painting like blocks or things on stretcher boards but you can make it work i wanted an acrylic one but the craftsman who made it said acrylic isn't going to work at that size because it's going to be so thin that it's going to bow down. An acrylic one theoretically would be great because then you could see the painting. So I'm sharing this tip because people usually want to want, people often wonder how I paint so fast, especially in places like Louisiana. It is because I am impatient and I literally cannot wait for paint to dry. So I'm sharing that tip, but it is definitely a your mileage may vary sort of thing. It's not something I'm necessarily recommending, but hey, you might want to try it out. So to add some darker shadows to the pine cone, I've mixed in some Payne's Gray. So this set does have a Payne's Gray, I believe. And I've mixed in some Payne's Gray with our Burnt Umber to get a really, really dark grayish brown. It, honestly, I use it as like a stand-in for black when I'm using the core set because the core set doesn't have a black either. You can use black. I would actually say go with like a sepia and then maybe mix in like a peach um, I think it's like peach black Holbein makes. Now, to be fair, that black is highly carcinogenic, apparently. So, like, I don't know. Maybe don't use it. Your mileage may vary. It's up to you. <laughs> YOLO. But, um, a, a browner black or a warmer black would work well for adding in those shadows here. So now that we've got the base basically painted all the major features, it's time to add some details to our supporting cast, the fir branches. And I'm using a really wet mix. Uh, it's mostly phthalo, but it's phthalo in that yellow from before. And I'm painting in kind of the shadowy parts of the branches at this point. And I'm using these little short brush strokes that kind of mimic the fir branches or the fir needles themselves. It's a similar technique that I use for painting animal fur as well. So I'm utilizing this technique all over the wreath, but I really want it to dry before I start applying the next layer because I want to get some pretty nice detail on these fir branches. And I have found that when you're painting like a lot of really small things like blades of grass or fur or fir branches, it's really good to keep it from just turning into mush that you do have some areas of like nice defined detail. Now you can still see a lot of the inks underneath that if that bothers you then if you were to ever do this again and using a watercolor round for this was a lot of fun so you might want to do this again 
uh, you might want to just use green or you might want to just ink it with black. Um, one of the reasons I like doing colored line arts like this is because it helps me control the contrast. If I just inked it with black, then we would already have that darkest color. And then if you paint on top of black, sometimes like opaque and semi-opaque colors will add like, it makes it look muddy and you have to re-ink it to get that contrast back. Using colored line arts like this, you may decide to re-ink some areas, but it helps you really control the contrast. So speaking of contrast, I'm now going in with mostly phthalo blue. There might be a little bit of yellow in here and I'm using that to really start painting in the shadows on the fir branches. So areas that are covered by other things, it's a great opportunity to use this, but also some of the branches kind of reaching out into the open center. But mainly if you're doing it on the branches, reaching out into the open center, you want to keep it kind of lower on the branches or on branches that are overlapped by other branches like you can see here. And this is going to not only add some contrast, but it's going to add some additional definition. So using the reference, the fir branches in my reference had a lot of yellow, a lot of olive green in them. And I wanted to maintain that to kind of get that like light filtering through leaves look, which is gorgeous. But I also wanted to make sure there was enough contrast that you could tell what these things were and it would make the really bright reds that we use for the poinsettias pop more. So I'm also going to go in with a little bit of burnt sienna and I'm just going to add in some little brown nodules like the ends of the fir branches. Sometimes with fir trees you'll get like these little like sappy knots at the end of them. I don't know about you guys and like having real Christmas trees in your house but I used to love those because they really smelled like Christmas tree and I'd get it like all over my hands. So that's how I know about that. But uh, once that all dried, I'm going in with just some white gouache and I'm going to add in some white highlights to basically everything, but not everything uniformly. You know what I mean? Like uh, the poinsettias are going to get some along the edges of the leaves and some in the center. Some of the pine cones are going to get them on those little crescents that we did earlier on just to kind of increase the contrast. Some of the magnolia leaves are going to get a little bit of white gouache along the edges. And I'm also going to like highlight some of the fir needles with white as well just to kind of add in some additional definition. So using a round watercolor block, today I showed you guys how to draw your own poinsettia wreath. This could be great for Christmas cards next year. It's really pretty simple. You just need some patience and an eye for detail. So practice makes perfect. You got a whole year till next Christmas to practice. Next, I utilized a color inking technique using the Tombow Fudenosuke brush pens. And I kind of walked you guys through my thought process for that. That's another practice makes perfect thing. Then we applied Da Vinci watercolors to create our luscious colors. And finally, we used a little bit of white gouache to add in some highlights.
So that about wraps it up for this watercolor tutorial. The materials were fairly simple and I promise once you have them, you're going to use them time and time again. I hope you guys will practice with them throughout the year and really level up because with anything, the more you use it, the better you get at doing it. So for all my friends who hoard their art supplies, do keep in mind, art supplies can spoil over time. So use them before you lose them, friends. I hope you guys found this tutorial helpful, useful, and informative. And I hope to see you guys again really soon. Have a great day, guys. Bye!